Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Modern Web Podcast. This is our first podcast of 2019, and really excited to discuss uh, some amazing uh, stuff that's coming out of Google, the AMP project. If you haven't heard of Accelerated Mobile Pages, um, I don't know where you've been, but it's definitely been a really big, awesome thing uh, that's been happening. So my co-host is Rob Osell, who is also an engineer at this dot. Hi, Rob. Hello. My name is Tracy. You can follow me on Twitter at Lady Lee. Always happy to help and uh, figure things out with you when it comes to JavaScript. And welcoming our first guest, Ben Morse. Hi, Ben. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what you do with uh, AMP? I can do that. Also, I can mention that although uh, AMP started mostly at Google, and most of the engineers and people working on it are still at Google. There's now a new governance model in place where a consortium of people from various companies and groups are now controlling the destiny of AMP. But as far as me, uh, my name is Ben Morris. I'm a developer advocate at Google, and my job is to help the web be better, be beautiful, be easier for developers, uh, better for users. And I also do a lot of work on AMP as part of that. Cool. Thank you so much. And then next up, we have Pratik and Chris, who are in the same room. So maybe, Pratik, uh, you can go first and introduce what you're doing on the AMP project. Hey, I'm Pratik. I work on the AMP project. And I'm working on stuff which, is, which are related to progressive web apps and AMP. So wherever there is a correlation between the two, wherever things intersect with, uh, on these two projects is where most of my work lie currently. So, and we'll be discussing a bunch of stuff that I'm doing that we are planning to do, and that's upcoming in the podcast. So, cool, awesome. And Chris? Hi, I'm Christopher Baxter. I'm really happy to be here. I, I work on web performance at Google. So, my, my hope is that I'm able to improve the performance of the web by at least 1% per year. A uh, big part of my energy and focus is uh, within the AMP project. Um, as well as a bunch of other open source projects that we, we push out for trying to improve application performance for other types of frameworks. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, excited to get started here. So um, first thing, uh, let me start off with a quick question. So as uh, we've been working with Ben, for example, on things, we've been talking a lot about how AMP makes it more accessible for developers who are starting to enter the JavaScript or development ecosystem. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about this initiative and how uh, AMP is trying to, how AMP helps um, accelerate sort of the ease of development? That's a good question. I may take that for a minute. I may start by saying what AMP actually is. That'll probably answer the question a little bit because not everyone knows what AMP actually is. There's a lot of myths about AMP and a lot of impressions that are kind of uh, kind of vague. Understandable, it's true about everything in this world. So what AMP is, is uh, simply a web components library, a sort of framework that's supposed to make it easier to make web pages that are load more quickly and are more kind of better for users and look better and so on and so forth. It's simply web pages though. So AMP is just the web, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But what AMP does is it adds those tags that aren't there in HTML that maybe should have been added at some point. When the web first began, it was just there to describe documents. So you had paragraph tags, you know, H1s, H2s, things like that. And now people do things on the web like Gmail. So it's gotten more complicated over the years, but there's no uh, tag to make a menu, for example, or to make a Twitter embed, or to have one of those little image sliders that, where images slide around the screen as you swipe. So AMP adds those things. It adds new tags to HTML via web components. So you can uh, now have tags that say things like AMP-sidebar, and that creates a little menu all by itself, which is kind of convenient. So that works because there's JavaScript that AMP loads up that makes those things work. Uh, on contrast, uh, AMP believes that many pages today have too much JavaScript, which makes pages slow, especially on worse connections, especially on uh, less powerful phones. So AMP restricts the way you can do JavaScript. It also restricts your CSS to 50K or less, and it places various restrictions on what you can do. On the other hand, when you follow the rules of AMP, there are spiders out there, web crawlers, that will find your page and will stick it in their caches. Google's cache is probably the best known. Microsoft has one, too. 
a couple other ones exist. And then if you find an AMP page on Google Search, it will preload aspects of it in an iframe before people click on it, because Google knows it'll be small. It won't be a lot of data brought to your phone. And then your page not only loads faster because it has less JavaScript, it loads faster because it's been partially preloaded. So it helps solve the problem of web pages loading slowly on mobile phones. And as part of this, with Look, it's easier for developers, too, because you're writing less code and getting more bang for your buck. There are some restrictions. There also are some benefits. Um, do you all want to add to that? I know I said a lot of things there and probably forgot about 10 of them. Yeah, I, I wanted to add one really important piece around uh, pre-rendering, um, which is kind of one of the most important parts of the AMP ecosystem. So as you mentioned on Google search results, for instance, uh, pages can be preloaded. The reason for this and the reason why it's an AMP specific feature is around privacy, uh, the way that privacy is preserved for pre-rendering. So if, let's pretend that you're on a search results page for any company um, and, they, and you search for a term. If you were to preload that content directly from the origin server, it would unintentionally tell the origin server that specific person was interested in this specific thing. And that could lead to downstream effects that you didn't intend. Maybe you really only accidentally searched for something, and now it will start to appear in advertisements uh, and follow you around. So the, the preserving of privacy is very important for pre-rendering, because you have not yet signaled intent to visit that thing. AMP does this very cleverly and very carefully and ensures that privacy is preserved as you uh, preload these documents based on the nature of how AMP is built. It has this as a first class concern all the way through from its concept stages to its current incarnations that are out uh, today. Great. So, <clears throat> so far we've touched on some of the performance implications of AMP and kind of the things that it does to try and improve the speed of the web. Just talked a little bit there about privacy. I was kind of curious on just sort of uh, leaning into that a little bit more and wondering if there were any other sort of core concepts or core philosophies of AMP besides just performance, besides maybe just privacy, that kind of guide where um, the library is going or the efforts that you guys take or when you try to decide priorities. There's a lot more to it, too. Um, I'll mention a couple of things, and I'm sure they'll mention a couple of things as well. Uh, one of the things AMP was supposed to solve, and I think it solved pretty well, is the problem where you're loading up some sort of content or a page, and as things load, such as a video or a picture, their size suddenly gets known to the browser as they're loading, and other content will move around on the page. The layout has to get redone a few times, which slows things down and also means you're watching things jump around as the page is loading. This is also about a pleasant user experience. So AMP makes you uh, define the size of your items in advance. So you leave a space for everything, whether it's an image or an ad or whatever it is, and things just kind of load and pop into their places. So the layout is easier. It also uh, AMP forbids distracting ads and other kinds of experiences that we think users dislike, like when things pop up on the screen and say, hey, buy this thing or subscribe immediately, which maybe works well for you, maybe doesn't, but users complain about these things. AMP disallows a lot of those things as well. Yeah, so touching on the, the piece around how content can shift around on the web, this is an extremely frustrating part of the mobile web, specifically. Um, so we call this layout stability. Um, AMP, in, by, by the way that it's designed, and the fact that you have to register the size of elements in advance, ensures that layout stability stays constant. So there are certain elements that can adjust the size of a page, but they can only do so when they're outside of the viewport, before there's been an opportunity to impact the things above it. Um, and th this, this stability is now trackable through a new API that's coming out that's uh, landing within Chrome, for instance, to start. Um, and we expect that you'll see uh, metrics that follow common popular sites that demonstrate the, the value of the layout stability that AMP provides out of the box versus um, things that don't work or have this as a first level concern. And AMP also wants to do more things that you can do as a developer that people don't always do, but you get them for free with AMP. For example, uh, it tries to lazy load things that are off of the screen. So if you've got an image or a YouTube embed that are below where you've gotten to on the screen, the wicked load ends, you get closer to those things. So you don't load things until they're about to be seen. Same with image carousels or image sliders, images that are off the screen, don't get loaded yet. And especially with videos, videos often have a lot of JavaScript. Certain video libraries that won't, won't name over here come with tons of JavaScript and also a lot of CSS. So it can be a really a slow, a slow thing for the mobile web and the web in general that 
AMP just makes better out of the box. And I, I think that lazy loading aspect is a, something that re deserves a little bit more uh, uh, comment. The, the real important reason that that works is that uh, AMP monitors and tracks things within the page. Because things are provided up front, you know how large and how big an, an image is, for instance, you reserve space for it within the document. And then as it starts to get close enough to where it's going to be appearing uh, with some tolerance per type of element, we can now lazy load those things in. This, this means that the layout stays stable, but it also means that you're only leveraging the resources that you need to up front. So if you visit a page that's 100 viewports long, you're never going to retrieve the resources for things below three viewports. This saves a lot of data and uh, for mobile plans that have a cap on the amount of data that they're allowed to provide per month. Um, and then when you go over, it uh, impacts your bill significantly. Um, this is a great way for, for people to access that content without worrying about it impacting their bills later on. I mean, that's really great. I mean, that, honestly, so that, that kind of idea of doing these kind of things, considering these kind of ideas, I mean, that's stuff that I bet there's a lot of senior developers out there that have never tried to implement something like this, let alone even thought of it as something that they wanted to try to implement on their site. So I think this goes back to what Tracy was saying about how this really is like a, a force multiplier for developers on the web. You know, they're just trying to figure out, I need to get a carousel. They're not really worried about how far necessarily down the page or, you know, the different APIs to lazy load those things. So there was two other issues that I know that developers struggle with a lot. I was just kind of curious what AMP does with them. One of them is um, accessibility is, is really huge. I know a lot of people struggle even just trying to understand what to do for accessibility. Um, and the other one can be security. You know, cross-site scripting is still issues that we deal with. So I was just kind of curious, does AMP uh, make an effort to tackle either of these two issues as well? Do you want to go first this time? <laughs> I'll go first on accessibility. Variety. <laughs> um, so uh, accessibility is in critically important for the web. Um, and because AMP is built on top of web components and there's standardized components with well-defined behavior, it's easier to accomplish accessibility within those specific components. Instead of having to hand roll every single thing on your website, you can lean on the experience and the, the use of those components across the entire web um, and gain accessibility for a lot of those things for free. This doesn't mean that you're completely like you're completely absolved of all of the responsibility around accessibility on your documents, but it does mean that you get a lot of it for free. Um, and if there are problems with the accessibility of a specific component within the AMP ecosystem, Improvements to that component impact the billions of documents that are leveraging those components across the web. So the, the, the force multiplier of accessibility for good is, is, is amplified here as well. You can say one fix impacts billions of documents in a way that makes them more accessible um, across the web. If you forget a certain attribute that's required for accessibility, the AMP validator will remind you of those things. It may even not let your page get uh, become valid AMP unless you actually include those things. And to that end, the cross-site scripting problem is a big problem on the web. And we see also problems where someone manages to inject a script on someone's site, the script then starts grabbing people's data, and this is bad. Uh, I know that in AMP, at least, if you put a script right there on your page, it won't pass validation. That's not part of AMP. You can't do that. So that will be discovered more easily if you're monitoring your pages for AMP, for AMP validity, which you should be doing. Um, you can use the new AMP script element that's coming out very soon to make JavaScript, but its use is restricted and it runs within a web worker. So I would imagine that would probably help. Do you have more things to say on this over? Yeah, I, I think we didn't. We said AMP validator a few times, but we didn't describe what it was. And that, that was my fault for not saying it earlier. Um, one of the nice things about the AMP ecosystem is that there's a validator that ensures your documents remain valid as you make changes to them. This validator is pretty in depth covers hundreds of rules and uh, provides clear descriptions when you create something that doesn't adhere to the specification. The idea there is not just because it needs to be perfect to be cached in the right way along uh, the caching lines from Cloudflare or other uh, caching providers, but because it means that we can enforce that things work consistently across all AMP documents. So users get a consistent beneficial experience rather than one that gets fragmented by something that's slightly broken on one, one AMP document versus another. And those these things tend to be things that are useful for accessibility or useful from a performance perspective. 
or that would break the AMP runtime if improperly implemented on a document. Yeah, that's super awesome. I mean, I think just having these tools and having somebody saying like, hey, you didn't do this, or hey, this doesn't work right now is, is really useful for developers as of late. I mean, we're all swimming, trying to you know keep up with the latest and greatest of everything. And uh, you know, some sometimes just having things built in, for me personally, I really like, um, which is why I really love frameworks. So bringing us to our next topic, uh, I know that you know when I heard about AMP, one of the first things I asked was, hey, can I use this with Angular or React? So I'd love to just talk a little bit more about how do you actually use AMP with different frameworks? I'll go first on this one, just real briefly. So um, before AMP script, so there's two eras in terms of framework compatibility. There's the before AMP script and the after AMP script um, eras. Before AMP script, it was totally valid to use any framework you'd like to server-side render a document. Then, and then you could validate that document against the AMP validator, and you'd be set to go. So if you preferred to use React-like syntax to generate documents, that was totally OK. Many people do that um, to generate AMP documents today. Um, the same thing goes for other frameworks like Angular uh, or Preact. Um, however, uh, in the post-AMP post script world, what we're introducing with AMP script is the ability to run runtime components from those frameworks on AMP documents. Now, this is a pretty in-depth topic, so we'll probably need to spend a little bit more time here, and I don't want to steal time from everyone else uh, to talk about this. Uh, but the, the idea is that you'll be able to leverage components that you've built that are specifically for your documents. So not something common across many documents, but something very specific to your document uh, within AMP script using whatever framework you would like, uh, as long as it's been approved and works well with uh, the implementation of the DOM that lives within the AMP script element. I always find it amusing, like whenever we talk about, uh, you know, if, you know, anytime anybody sees a new technology, they're just like, okay, wait, how do I use this in my context? How do I shove this thing in so it works in what I kind of quite understand? So. It's, uh, it's nice to see sort of like the evolution of kind of what you guys are doing. I'm very excited about it because I would go meet developers and they'd say, oh, AMP sounds like a wonderful thing. Um, how to use it with my, uh, my React, my friend, my server, uh, my client side. I'd say, well, you really can't do that. But maybe if you have a giant amount of JavaScript which is required to build your page in the first place, maybe it should be on the server in the first place. If you're controlling the page that with React or Angular or something else, you couldn't do it. And they seem very sad because people invest a lot of time in these things may still be overkill sometimes to use a framework for a simple site. But now with AMP script, you'll be able to use your favorite framework all over again. Um, the idea behind AMP script is that JavaScript wasn't trusted by AMP because it can do all kinds of things and slow down a page. But with AMP script, it runs inside a web worker on its own thread. And I believe, if Chris will tell me if I'm wrong over here, I believe it doesn't run on startup either. That user action is required to trigger some sort of AMP script. So it can't slow things down as you're loading the page but it can then control the page once the user begins to interact with it. Yeah, so the, the important part around AMP script is that it's still in development, um, and there are things that are changing about it pretty rapidly. But the idea is that we want to make sure that AMP's constraints are still valid in the post-AMP script world. So um, a thing that is a valid AMP document before and after remains valid. Um, and those constraints are things like, you cannot change the content of a document before the person has interacted with it. Um, you can imagine how frustrating this would be as a user. I go to visit a common news article that I'm really interested in, and the moment I land on that page, I get a full page overlay telling me to subscribe to their newsletter. Um, I wasn't there for the newsletter. I was there for the content. Um, and so AMP specifically prohibits this kind of behavior, and AMP script will need to continue to prohibit this kind of behavior. Um, so that's why there's all sorts of uh, things that are done to, within AMP script to try to make it um, friendly towards other frameworks and towards uh, generic vanilla JavaScript, but still applies the constraints that AMP has around document structure and interaction requirements uh, for mutations. So I also know that, uh, Pratik, you work a lot on the PWA side of things, or PWA, as I like to say. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the uh, PWA integration with AMP? Yeah, um, so one thing I'd actually like to add to the last question is mm -hmm. uh, 
because it somewhat also intersects with the uh, PWA, how people build PWA today with um, AMP. There's a little less known uh, version of runtime of AMP that we have as the shadow uh, mode. So you can use, instead of the regular AMP runtime, if you want to use AMP content within your uh, web page, written with whatever your framework is, you can use this uh, runtime, the shadow runtime, and tell that runtime that only take this container, uh, take this particular div, and render my AMP content inside this div. So that that's one one more way, not as uh, I would say, not as easy as using an AMP strip, but uh, how people are actually doing uh, AMP inside their favorite frameworks even today. Uh, now coming over to the PWA first, uh, AMP from the very beginning has had an AMP install service worker extension, which basically means that you give us the page that installs your service worker and at, at the uh, page, which is served by the Google cache, we will inside the iframe open that page and install the service worker through which you can pre-cache your assets and the whole journey uh, from there for your domain becomes really, really, really fast. Um, there, there have been like continuous additions to it. Like uh, people have been asking for custom scopes because they just want to install service worker for push notifications. So these are the these are few things that we do on a daily basis. But there is a there's one very interesting project that we are uh, planning out right now. It it's an AMP service worker helper. So it's like you just uh, we give you a script to add to your service worker. Like that's that's the whole code of it. And uh, in the end, it controls how the AMP strips are loaded. Uh, do they come from cache? For how long do they come from cache? Uh, if, if your page is valid AMP, uh, it can cache that as well. And you know, with a proper strategy, respond from network first, or if the network is really, really poor, then respond it from cache. And basically it sets a very sane set of defaults for your service worker. And you don't have to do any kind of configuration if uh, if you're an AMP first web app. So it takes control of your entire web app. It knows how we deploy AMP scripts uh, with our usual deployments. It knows how AMP uh, pages behave or fetches those scripts. So it, uh, it can control all of that set uh, same defaults to it uh, to itself. You can, however, take control of these defaults and change them to tell us like, here are the assets that also need to be cached and are like super sensitive to this page. And we can check if they are like, they are permissible to be pre-cached. For example, they are in the first viewport or not. And so we pre-cache them. So that's one project that, that's, that we are still planning and thinking how it can help more and more developers. So if it's if you are an AMP first web app, or even if you're not, the AMP portion of your web app can be easily controlled with this small code that we give you. OK. Um, first of all, before I ask a follow-up question, I just wanted to check, because I was online, and I saw somebody using like the acronym uh, PWAMP, a PW AMP. And I'm just wondering if this is official, because I think you guys should be running with this if it's not official. <laughs> um, is this something you guys have seen? Is this is this the official name for this technology? It is most fun um, to say it, so that's right. that helps. <laughs> okay, so for the for these PWAMPs then, or these PWA uh, AMP um, things, you kind of touched on a little bit there, but could you go a little bit more about what what adding the concept of PWAs does to some of the cool parts of the AMP architecture? You know, we talked. I think we talked about the AMP cache. Um, and, and the validator and some of the constraints that it puts on. And you kind of mentioned like the shadow runtime. I'm just kind of curious in what ways um, it's changing some of the things that maybe not using a PWA or just using an AMP first website does. Um, are there any other things that people should be aware of, of how it changes the way that an AMP site acts? Sure. Um, so AMP as a runtime is still a JavaScript uh, runtime. So anything that your network does to your page, like the network instability, if it's like uh, if the network is flaky, these are still the things like 
which your main thread JavaScript cannot control. So that's where the uh, whole concept of PAM comes in. Uh, you still need like a service worker running to actually control these things. So the whole project is like plan, hey, we have a very solid uh, main thread runtime or like with Amstrip, we have runtime going beyond main thread, but there is nothing in this runtime which can actually take care of what if the network goes off, like where will the HTML or the markup even come from? So this is like a drop-in code uh, for your AMP web apps and this code will know how AMP first web app or the whole or, or the whole AMP runtime works and thus can fetch uh, the scripts or the markup or the assets for that markup uh, like in time when the network's there and can pitch in when the network is actually uh, flaky and can just let uh, and just step away if the network is good and get fresh content always get the fresh script always and can only and would uh, decide when to step in and intercept those network requests. So that's where the whole concept of plant lies, where it's like we, we, have, so we still have a need of something controlling or uh, monitoring the flakiness of our networks. Yeah, so if I, if I could add into this too, um, the, the <laughs> idea about some of these projects is that uh, many AMP documents come with, uh, all AMP documents, in fact, come with this set of constraints. Um, and those constraints are knowable constraints, which means that we can apply PWA and technology in a, a consistent way. The idea is we could convert almost every uh, AMP document into something that is powered by a service worker. Um, and it would improve the re network reliability of those documents. But it doesn't just live within the, uh, the, the sections that are AMP specific. Um, if we build this the right way and we have enough time to get it absolutely great, we could also improve the ability to hand off uh, from your AMP sections of your website to other sections of your website. So we could know things like when the person loads an AMP document, there's a link on the AMP document that points to something else on, the, on your domain, but that's not powered by AMP. Um, and so we could, just like we do with AMP, preload parts of that uh, subsequent document. So the idea would be the transitions remain consistent and fast. You, when you transition to the AMP document, you're preloaded in advance. When you transition away from the AMP document to something that you just haven't converted to AMP or that runs in something that's not doable within the AMP constraints, well, that, that, that transition is just as fast because it's been preloaded in advance. Um, and this is more knowable because of the constraints that we, can that we apply up front uh, to those documents. I want to step Great. back also and summarize some of the popular patterns out there for Quamp because we've talked about everything, I think, but haven't actually laid out the patterns just you know clearly and simply. So let me try to do that. If I fail, then please uh, make them more clear and simple that I'm about to try to do. I can think of three patterns that I have seen. Um, one of them is just that your AMP can also be a PWA. So you can add in PWA features to an AMP document. It's not hard to do things like you know make a full screen or uh, add to your home screen manifests. You can add a service worker for offline experiences and so on using FSL server worker components. So AMPs can themselves have PWA characteristics. Um, you can also this is a more popular pattern I think is you can have as uh, they were just talking about there an AMP that transitions gradually to PWA. So we believe in general that your first page that people get to should be AMP or as fast as AMP if you don't use AMP, because that's the first experience. People like to have a really quick experience going from an ad, land, an ad to a landing page or from search or whatever they do. So people often have their first page be AMP. After that, you go from there into the PWA as people navigate around your site. To make this smoother and faster, you can also install the service worker on the AMP the service worker can then load up the components with the PWA. So you're on your next click, you're there very quickly. It can also then, the service worker can actually control, again, where you're navigate to because it can control navigations. So AMP to PWA is a second option that we see done pretty often. The third thing that exists is AMP also is an embeddable content format. You can get a bit of AMP into other things. It's supposed to be uh, like transportable. So that's part of what AMP's idea is. That should be a thing you can embed in something else. You get a bit of fast web into a different device, even or a different kinds of context. Uh, in this case, 
you can use what's called Shadow AMP, which uses AMP in a Shadow DOM. You can have a PWA. Sorry, my, my hands are getting very big, aren't they? I'm gesturing right in front of my camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they look terrible. It's just the camera. My hands aren't actually like that. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to gesture down here where you can't see the gesturing. Uh, what was I saying? Yes. So you can embed AMP inside a PWA with Shadow DOM and Shadow AMP. You can take a single, a single element of your PWA DOM and get a whole AMP inside that element, which is pretty cool. For example, you can, if you have news articles that already exist, which are an AMP, which is very common, you can make a different kind of news reader experience around those news articles. You can have a PWA where the news articles show up within a single part of the page. And then around that are various nice navigational features and other things you can do with JavaScript. And in fact, if you're curious, we've got a demo called the Shadow Reader, which is at amp.cards. That's the URL, amp.cards. And it follows this pattern where AMP is inside PWA. Also, to make things uh, faster and we think better in general, when you first visit this demo, you look at the AMP version of the article. If you go to an article page in this demo, you get an AMP version. Your next visit will be in the PWA. That means your first page is really fast. While you're looking at the AMP page over there reading the article, the service worker is loading up the PWA stuff, and you're in your second click, there you are inside the PWA. This also is good for search because not all search engines are good at using JavaScript. So if your PWA loads all your content using JavaScript, then not all search engines can actually ever read that. Sorry, not all web crawlers can actually read the, use JavaScript and read your contents. If your first page is AMP, for a search engine's web crawler, the first page, sorry, for a web crawler, every single page is a first view. They have no cookies, they have no history. So this way you're giving web crawlers all your content by giving them the AMP page. So to summarize that, this is an AMP <laughs> that then transitions to AMP inside PWA, which maybe is best for users, for web crawlers and the universe. Great. So that was uh, that example that you said that was up there. Is the code for it also available as a reference, or is um, or, or just to sort of show people the potential of the technology? We have hidden the code somewhere. No. Um, yes, it's on GitHub. Oh, okay. That's great. So actual URL for that. But if you look for a shadow reader or GitHub, you'll probably find this. Oh, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> So we've sort of danced around and teased around some different things. We've talked about different governance models. We've talked about AMP script. We've kind of talked some of the AMP PWA stuff. Um, sort of to, to crystallize and formalize that, looking ahead to 2019, through 2019, what are some of the things that are on your guys' long-term plan? Like, What are places where uh, you know, you're still looking for feedback for some of your ideas on where to take the library? Like, is there anything else about 2019 that you either wanted to tease or just sort of uh, talk in broad strokes about where AMP's going? Well, let me, let me start on that one. Uh, so AMP is a portable content unit. Each individual document is a portable content unit. So we talked about how you could leverage them within a PWA, for instance, or within a shadow reader. But you can also leverage them in other places, like, say, inside Gmail or inside your favorite other email uh, reader. So we've announced an initiative that allows you to use AMP documents within emails. Um, so this allows you to do things like interactive experiences within an email. Um, that's a pretty powerful feature for the right set of use cases. If I want to reserve to a birthday party in advance, I can do, th do so through my email client directly without having to leave it. Um, I, if I want to uh, comment on a document or do something different, Maybe that could be built within an email directly and not need me to load the entire other web experience. Very targeted experience, and that's part of that portable content. We also touched a little bit on the PWA side. We have a lot in the works when it comes to PWAs. We want to make it really easy for everyone to, to generate a PWA from their AMP content. We want that to be something that is so simple that everyone can do it out of the box and not need to worry about additional amounts of configuration unless it's valuable to them. We talked about AMP Script. AMP Script is going to be a big part of our initiatives this year. It will unlock the ability for people to use uh, custom JavaScript on their, on their AMP documents, things that are specific to their domains, but maybe not shared across the entire web. We believe this will make AMP adoption easier. It will also make it uh, simpler for people to do interactive experiences with AMP, which are supported today without AMP Script using something called um, uh, AMP Bind. Uh, however, we think AMP Script will unlock this for more people. 
Great. Ben, anything else that, you, that you're working on or that you, you've been privy to that you wanted to tease, or do you think you've dropped all the teasers that you have uh, for 2019? Well, big changes coming up this year. Uh, also, Chris mentioned the idea of embedding a bit of AMP content into email. I've seen this in a demo, and it was shockingly powerful to actually, for example, respond to someone's comment with your own comment right there in an email without opening an application at all. It's actually shockingly useful. <laughs> when I saw it, I was actually smiled. Uh, other things that are coming up, there are those who are unhappy because if you use AMP on your device, if you, you might sometimes not see your own URL because things are being served from a cache, which is owned by someone else, and that's not a great experience. So there's an initiative being worked on now called Web Packaging or Signed Exchanges, where if your content belongs to a certain site, even if some other CDN serves that, if you know that from your site, and you agree to this, there'll be a way of making this agreement behind the scenes, magically and cryptographically, and then actually browsers can show the original domain, which is much nicer. I've seen this actually demoed in Chrome Canary, so it's on its way pretty soon. Also, uh, AMP is not a ranking factor for Google, so if your AMP page, page is AMP, it doesn't rank, or doesn't rank more highly because of that. Although if your page is clicked on more and is faster, those are ranking factors that can matter. But we're working on also an effort to give pages that are not AMP, but are as good as AMP in terms of layout consistency and in terms of speed, the same treatment as AMP. So publishers will sometimes use AMP just to get into the stories carousel that appears on top of google.com on mobile devices. We think you should use it because your pages are faster and maybe it makes your life easier in various ways. But you might just say, I want to get into that search carousel. And various privileges will be allowed to non-AMP pages that are AMP-like in the future. I think there are more things I'm forgetting. Maybe you guys will remember some more over there. Well, we'll leave a few surprises for people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so kind of one of the last things I wanted to touch on, and um, it's just kind of the different ways that the community can get involved. Because Ben, I know you and I have talked sometimes about like when I've been using AMP, some of the discrepancies between AMP binds. I mean, this will be a little bit in the in the weeds, but. Uh, some of the differences between the ant bind syntax and the mustache syntax, uh, template syntax. Um, so I've seen some people post um, issues where like maybe they wanted a particular attribute or property of a component to be bindable where it isn't currently. Sometimes people might say, hey, this component's really good. I can look at YouTube videos or the Vimeo videos, but what about this other new video service? Is there a component for that? So there's all these different ways. Uh, one of the last ones might be somebody coming from another one of those frameworks we mentioned, and they're like, I love this part of this framework, is that something AMP can do, right? So a lot of people are interested as they start using AMP to like uh, to, to make improvements or to see it grow. What are some of the best ways, and maybe each of you can speak it, speak to it in the part that, that you work with most, uh, most commonly, but like what are the ways that people can get plugged in or contribute or suggest ideas or maybe even contribute code uh, to help uh, the AMP community out? Question is kind of self-answering there. I think you said it all yourself. But certainly, we want people to give feedback and to suggest ideas because people that use AMP every day, they know the best what should be an AMP or what isn't an AMP yet. So those uh, feature requests on GitHub are always needed. There's always, always a Slack channel you can use to go ahead and suggest things or to make requests or if you have problems, mention those kinds of problems. We also monitor Stack Overflow pretty carefully. But I think making issues is one of the best things. And also, AMP is an open source project, and we very much want more people to come in, make components, and make new features. Yeah, I want to double down on the uh, uh, it's an open source project, and we love contributions thing. And the reason I, I say that is um, the AMP code base is pretty straightforward to follow. Um, there's not a lot of things that are unique to it that you wouldn't find in other JavaScript code bases. Um, and as a result, it's really welcoming for new committers. Uh, we have a huge series of good first issues for people to look at to get familiar and comfortable with the code base. Um, installing and getting the AMP uh, runtime up on your machine so you can make changes takes less than 20 minutes. Um, and that's with uh, if from scratch, uh, if you've never even installed uh, Xcode or something similar. Um, it's pretty easy to get going. And I, I think as a result, um, it's fun to experience and try to make a change within, within the AMP code base because it reaches so many documents across the web. So I'd encourage, if you're running into a problem, crack open the AMP code base off of GitHub and see if you can make a change that fixes it. 
you know, we're not just saying that. We very, very much welcome contributors and anybody to take part in the AMP community and help make AMP as good as possible. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can vouch for that. I, like I said, recently I was looking for why it was I couldn't change the tweet that AMP Twitter was looking at uh, dynamically using a binding, and I, I found a GitHub issue for it. And uh, some of the maintainers were super nice and said, actually, this is really easy to do. So we're going to put first time contributor status on this ticket. Here's the steps one, two, three, four that you have to follow. Um, you know, and it, it was it was it was really awesome. I mean, it's awesome to see that kind of stuff to get to get people to draw them into contributing to the community. Um, Pratik, you kind of mentioned the PWA stuff you're working on. Is there any unique opportunities for the community in what you're doing, or um, or is it just sort of the same thing that we've heard from uh, Chris and Ben? So uh, it's definitely it's going to be on the same uh, similar kind of repo under the same org uh, when it comes out. But the way that we are planning it is it will be a set of modules, a set of drop-in modules, a, a set of um, drop-in plugins. So anything that you want a service worker can do uh, or should do for your use case, you can just come in and contribute to that particular repo with your small module. So it's like, it'll be, uh, it'll be like you don't have to go through the entire process of uh, how this thing works end to end. We will try to like have an outline or an, or an interface for every module to follow and you can just drop in your implementation there. So the, it will still be on the same lines, super easy and helpful for the first time contributors to come in and shine in with their modules. That's so exciting. I mean, it's great to see, right? It's like, OK, building AMP to make it easier for developers, make it easier for developers or people who aren't developers to actually build websites. And then also, you guys have been so, so, so nice on those different repos and making everybody feel welcome to even invite them into open source. So I love that sort of uh, theme that you guys have going on uh, with folks working on AMP. Yeah, and uh, don't, don't be scared. People that are involved are nice. They're not going to make fun of you. Ask questions. Try some stuff out. Write some code. No, no question is a stupid question. That is the most important thing to know. Uh, because a lot of times it's like, oh, we didn't even think about that. Maybe we should actually build this thing. So Very much so. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, again, you can follow, you can actually follow all these guys on Twitter. So Ben Morse, Pratik Batnagar, and then Christopher Baxter. Uh, again, this is Modern Web. You can follow us on Twitter at modern.web. And other than that, we'll see you for the next episode. Thanks, Tracy and Rob, for having us. Thank you.